teaching that most of you are in a different territory than I am. I am in the northern part of the state. I am as pretty much as far north as you can get. And I'll show you a little bit. These are my these are the people that I live amongst the Wiat. I live in their territory and I acknowledge that. And that's important for me to do that. And it's important for all of us to do it because it's part of the larger scope of healing and reconciliation. What I look at and it's really, I look at it. Everyone's like, well, what do you research? And it's like, well, I read a lot, but I look at things is what stops us from reconciling with the past, healing from the past, creating a society in which the divisions are not as great that we can actually talk to one another versus just have each other yelling at back and forth each other. That's, that's really what I do. So I do a lot of sitting around and listening. So this is really where I'm from. Um, this is a significant little area up here in that this is the first place that a municipality returned land to native people. The city of Eureka returned the Wiat center of the world, which is Talawat, a small island in the bay, back to the Wiat people. Um, small portion of 2014 and the rest in 2019 and that's a significant was a significant way to connecting people together so i just i want to frame it that way i'm going to talk tonight um and just walk you through how we got to where we're at and some of the processes that happened some of the ways that we're still dealing with this and that's really where i'm going and how our landscapes fit into that so I want you to just take one second and think about how you understand landscape. What is it that you see in landscape? Because we tend to only think of landscape generally as the natural world around us versus the incorporation of the people, the incorporation of the stories, all those components that come together. And if you were sitting in my class on the first day, I would be that cruel instructor who would tell you to take out paper and a pen and write for 15 minutes about this. I'm not going to have you do that tonight. And it's important because we have to ground ourselves in where we're at. And one of the things that is common throughout all indigenous societies is the understanding of place and how place connects to everything, how it informs culture, how it informs beliefs, how it informs language. And prior to contact, California was very different. Prior to contact, you had more indigenous populations and communities living here than anywhere else. You had languages in the hundreds that were spoken. But the one thing that is common amongst all of these is the interconnection of place and that everything had a story to it. The mountain might have a name. The ocean had a name. The lake had a name. Everything had a name that told the story of where of, of what it was. You might have called a place of, that had once been salt uh, freshwater and had renamed it with a word that meant salt because there was a story connected to that. We have a place very close to us, our bay. This Wiats tell the story of how it was once a freshwater lagoon until a young man fell madly in love with a woman who rejected him. And because that was the place that she would go and gather and do stuff, he went and peed in it and turned it into salt, which is why it's called wiki, salt. That tells us a story that tells us there's something there that we miss in just seeing landscape as physical things, as a place versus the entire story of that. And when you look at California as a whole, we don't necessarily see California as really what it is. We have a story about California. It was born out of the gold rush. It has a much deeper and longer history than that. And the gold rush was really centralized into one part of California. It's not the whole story. It's not the whole story at all. But we need to look at the languages and understand that there were more indigenous languages spoken here than anywhere else in North America. 
the different dialects that came together, the family groups that came together. That's all, that's all in California. And that's all part of who we are and what we're doing. I'm going to give you a little bit of the history so we can get to where we need to be. And those languages are part of the landscape. They're informed by the environment, the natural world that's around. They express who a people are and how they communicate with their creator, their God, what they believe in. That is their communication to them. So when we talk about native languages being revitalized, there tends to be a general theme of, oh, it's wonderful. It's this great thing. They're, they're learning their language. It's much more than their language. It is the culture. It is the place that they belong in their own societies and amongst everybody else. And those languages need to be used day in and day out to, like everything else to express how we fit into the larger world. Prior to contact, prior to non-Indigenous people, Euro-Americans, Europeans, settlers, however we want to phrase this, California and the Native people lived in a very strong balance with one another. Indigenous people used the land to provide for themselves, to provide for their families, to provide for their communities. They learned from it. They developed a strong sense of what we call traditional ecological knowledge. The knowledge you get from being in a place, knowing when to gather, knowing when to hunt, knowing when to fish, knowing when it is time for ceremony, knowing all of these things because of the place you live. That is the integration of the environment and the people together. And it's important to understand that if you take the person out of the place, they still hold that knowledge, but that knowledge may not be usable in another place. I, I joke a lot of times with people when they ask, well, what do you know? And I'm like, I know that when this plant do not ask me the name of the plant. I am not a botanist and I have never been able to survive a botany class. I know that when that plant turn has a little pink flowers on it, I know that's when you go out and gather seaweed. I know that because that's what I was taught. Someone taught that to me, but I, I don't know the scientific part of it. I just know it's that plant. That doesn't serve me well if I'm on the East Coast that doesn't serve me well any place else. So that, that's sort of what we have to understand is, you know, we have to stop seeing native people, indigenous people as a homogenous group. The traditional ecological knowledge of the Kumeyaay is very different than the traditional ecological knowledge of the Yurok or the Mono or the Miwok or the Maidu because we are all from different places. Our stories and our lives are formed by these geographic areas that we live in. And while we may have a lot in common in the sense of how we interact with the world, our knowledge may not necessarily be transferable. There was a disruption and it was a cataclysmic disruption with contact. And I'm focusing here on the missions primarily now because these, this is really where you see indigenous society in California experience the loss of it, the loss of its present, its past, and its future. You know, we, my sisters and I, started off in Washington State, and my parents brought us back to California, just about the time my middle sister was getting ready to go into, I think it was the fourth grade where you build the California mission project at that time. And of course we're extreme Northern California and they come to us and say, okay, we're going to go to Disneyland. Oh, this is great kids. Yes, we're going to Disneyland. They forgot to tell us a very important component of this, which was that we were going to stop at every single mission between here and Anaheim. Actually, we went beyond that. We ended up in San Diego. I am here to tell you folks, I have seen them. If you've seen one mission, I believe you have seen them all. And it was important for us to do that 
because that is a component of the history of California that we do not separate from the birth of the state. It's a piece that we don't interrogate enough in that, yes, these were missions, but they were primarily military outposts. Their primary purpose were to serve as centers of commerce. They were used to exploit native populations. A few years ago, the Huntington Museum in Pasadena did a great exhibit on Father Sarah, just as he was going up to be canonized for sainthood. And if you walk through that exhibit, there was very little mention of indigenous people, even though that is who he had the primary con contact with and the most impact on. And as you got through the exhibit, you, I began to notice that there was a painting of a burning of a mission in Texas. And I'm like, okay, natives in Texas revolted, burnt the mission, but where's the expression of California? Where's expression of what happened here? The only other component of that exhibit to touch on indigenous people was a large beam about six feet long two feet by two feet square. I had these little d dents in that little dents and I was interested so I wandered over to look at it. This was where if a native person ran away, fled the mission to return to their home, their ankles would be strapped to it and then they would be broken. Looking at the interpretive material around that exhibit, there was a very small, small label buried almost under another piece that you could find that it explained what this was. Thinking about that, why was it that way? Why did we hide this? Why, was, why did the exhibitors, why did the curators do this? In part, it's out of shame. It's out of a reluctance to face the past. Because if we face the past, if we acknowledge the past, we become responsible to do something. We become responsible for that knowledge. And that is a call to action that requires us to do something. What we do is undefined. In all of that, we don't necessarily look at the missions as separate from the history of the state in and of itself. You know, thinking it back, for those of you who went to California schools or children in California schools, they're just part of the California curriculum. This was under another sovereign. This was not under the United States. This was under Spain. This was under Mexico. This was the great disruption that upended the way native people from the San Francisco Bay Area to what we now call the Mexico border had their world in interrupted. And I say, I say interrupted because it was almost put on pause. We're coming in and we are going to tell you how to live. We are going to convert you. We are going to forcibly convert you to Christianity. We are going to erase your names. Native children and native men and women were taken to these missions to be baptized. Their native name, their name that they were given would be recorded in a book and then they would be given a new name, a European style name that they would be called. And those records have been sealed up until only, only the last few years. There's a question, David? Yes, Carrie, uh, this comes to us from AJ, uh, one of our attendees. She was asking, uh, or rather mentioning the missions down in Baja. And she would love mm -hmm. to see if these connected and tied to the Alta California missions. Okay. Those are part of the same mission system. They did just as much disruption in Baja California as they did here. We don't have, or I don't have, I should say, I don't have an incredible amount of information on them because it's sort of 
beyond the scope that I look at. But you can go into the Huntington Library now has a completely digitized set of the mission records. So you can go into those. And I believe some of the Baja missions are also connected, are also in there. One of the issues we run into with the mission system in Mexico is because of the Catholic Church's position during the Mexican independence movement from Spain, the Catholic Church was outlawed in the country of Mexico. Um, technically still is. Many of those church records were destroyed. So what records we do have from Baja were what were able to be brought into the United States. So I hope I hope that answers your question. Or if not, ask another and I'll try again. <laughs> That'll be good. Think about this. You're sitting at home one night, an evening like this. You're enjoying your dinner. Knock at the door, you open it. Here are some people you've never met. They look inside. They walk in. They set themselves up. They take over your kitchen table. They take over your rooms. They take over your living room. And they just stay. They're the uninvited guest who never left. That is the experience of indigenous people in this, in, in this state and throughout North and South America. It's become a balancing act of how do we acknowledge that? Because the way California and most of North America was looked at was as terra nullis, vacant land. Nobody was farming. They weren't building big cities. They weren't doing the things that were deemed to be civilized by European standards. So therefore, it was vacant. It could be taken. And what has happened over the centuries has this society has developed in which we all live here. We all benefit from it. We all live within it. Yet we haven't dealt with that component of how do we actually talk about this and share it without pointing fingers and blaming and worried about what will happen if we take this. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more, more about that towards the end here because there's an interesting thing happening here in the state. The gold rush happens and I'm condensing this history just to get to the fun stuff. And we talked about the gold rush is you know, here it is. All of California was this giant gold bastion. Really, it was more central in parts of Northern California. It's where the gold fields are. But, you know, when you talk about California and its history, it's gold. Not mentioning the transportation, the commerce that was coming out of Southern California, all of those components that were there. But it's also the start of what Ben Madley, who is at University of California, Los Angeles, calls American genocide. And between 1848 and 1873, over a 25 year period, the state of California embarked on what can be called one of the largest government sponsored at the time, genocides. The, United, the state of California paid people to kill Indians. This is documented in the state legislative record. This is documented in the letters of governors. This is in county archives. This was the policy of the state to eliminate Indians throughout the state of California. So you ask yourself why there are places in California called Bloody Island. It's because where a massacre happened. Our landscape tells us our history. You know, one of the things I deal with quite a bit is people coming and going, so why aren't we teaching local history? Why didn't I learn this? And the only answer I have is, were we really looking? Were we looking beyond the names of places? Were we looking, are we asking those questions of follow-up? What does it mean to have a place with this name? 
what are those tan and brown placards designating historic sites up and down the highways? Because we see them, we all see them, we drive past them. You always think, oh, I'm going to stop there. What is the story about that? And then whose history is being captured there? This is what is built into our landscape. This is what's built into this. You know, when you look out at these large fields as you drive through central California, or you look at across the deserts and Southern California, across the waterways, we're seeing places that have a real past that have captured and saw incredible things, celebrations, births, deaths, massacres, great ingenuity. But we tend to get caught up in the green blur. The I'm going from point A to point B and not seeing the history, not seeing everything that's in between. And that disassociates us from our own local history. I mean, think about your commute to work every day. What is it you're not seeing? Because you're not the first person to, cry, to do that. You're not gonna be the last. You know, I'm an academic, so I suffer from an academic's malady, which is old things interest me. Sitting down and going through old photographs for hours and hours and hours is a pastime. It's relaxing. But it's interesting, you look at those old photos and you look at everything else and you bring those together and you begin to see something. You begin to see that we are just layering everything on top of each other. There was a comment on the local news the other night that the news is the first draft of history. And I had to think about that for a minute and I went, well, really? Wouldn't it be the second or the third draft? Because the first draft really is our doing it what we did and what is seen. And think about how we learn things. We wait for archeologists to dig them up. We are continually layering our history on top of each other and then sort of surprised that it's there, even though we knew it, because we already did it. The gold rush impacted us. California becomes a state and they have to figure out what to do with all these Indians. So they sent in a group of in agents from Washington, DC, a bunch of Indian agents, and they negotiated a series of treaties. What you see here on the screen, these dark areas are the treaties. These are the lands that native people reserved for themselves. They said, okay, here's the deal. You, the United States can have the rest of it. We want this. This is where we're gonna stay. And notice, if you look at this map, think about some of the places that are there. I mean, Central, there's a bunch of fields there, you know, even up where we're at, way up here at the top, well, a bunch of trees. It's pretty an area just for them. These treaties are negotiated. They are signed in good faith by tribes and by the agents. They are sent to the United States Senate who does something the Senate has never done before. They seal the record and they put the treaties unratified into a file cabinet in the basement of the Senate where they sat until the 1970s. So from the time right after gold is discovered, all up until the 1970s, most California tribes were stuck in limbo. They were federally recognized, they had a place, they had things, but they had been disowned by the very group who'd come in and promised them something. And this sets up a whole series of political events that go on and on and are still trying to be resolved today but it breaks a trust. It breaks the willingness to have faith in what 
the government says it breaks the faith and and trusting what other people are saying that can and cannot be done and california grows we get new counties we get the railroads it's all exciting and then we decide to disrupt that even more the federal government at the end the state of california initiated a boarding school process in which children were taken and you've probably heard this before children at the direction of the united states government were taken from their mothers their fathers their grandparents their aunts and uncles and taken to boarding schools this is the Indian school in Bishop, California. It still operates today. It's a much different system. Uh, the school took a lot of children from Southern California, uh, Nevada, Colorado, Arizona. Children were beaten if they spoke their language. We have the documentation records showing there was mass sexual abuse This is um, Sherman Indian High School, or the Sherman Indian Institute at the time. It's now called the Sherman Indian High School in Riverside, California. This is not the greatest image, but this image shows what I want to point out here and why this is important. This looks like a military parade. The curriculum at the boarding schools was a military curriculum. It was a curriculum in which children were taught to march. They marched in the morning, they marched in the evening, they wore very strict uniforms. These schools upended the way gender was perceived by an indigenous people. These schools imposed the concept that men would be farm workers, they would be agrarians, they would do blacksmithing, they that's what they did. They did men's work. Women were taught to be homemakers, to cook, to clean. That is very different from what had been life prior to contact, prior to an assimilation effort. There were roles. I'm not going to, I won't say there weren't, but women could hunt women generally were the primary wealth keepers you know everyone always asks well are they matrilineal societies or patrilineal societies and i'm like they were a little bit of both california native californians had a very advanced concept of these things that there were well, actually all natives of California, but I'm gonna just make California sound better because that's where we're at, <clears throat> is that women held the wealth. You traced your family lineage, both through your mother and your father. If a man wasn't there, a woman could easily take over the male role. Men could do women's jobs. There was a fluidity to it and that was erased. So I'm bringing you that point to get to what I want to talk about. I take the long way around. What does it mean for us to look at the where we live? What does it mean to look at all of these places and understand that history? It, it means that we have to somehow move ourselves to think about landscape differently, to understand that it is a reflection of the past. We can find the evidence there, but it's also about our present and how we are going to tell the story of our cities, of our counties, and of our state. And we have to be willing to face that darkness. We have to be willing to say it was bad it was bad. There's no doubt about it. It was bad. 
But what happens when you don't deal with it? We've all done it. We've all gotten that sliver. You've been out in the garden or you've been doing something, you've gotten that sliver and you just, you can feel it. And you're like, ah, uh, you don't deal with it. And it festers until it becomes a bigger problem. That's what we're doing by not facing it, by not interrogating it and interacting with it and questioning it. We're allowing that to fester underneath the surface I had the opportunity a year ago to visit Auschwitz and Birkenau. And I was there with representatives from the civilian government of the United States. And I, I make that very clear that there were no military individuals there. Represent the Civil Rights Commission, Federal Bureau of Investigations, USAID. And we were talking about divided societies. And in part of the conversation, members from the Federal Bureau asked a question that like, why is it we have such a hard time dealing with native people? Why is it when we show up? What, why do we receive this action, reaction? They don't like us. And I had to sit back and I said, well, it's not you they don't like, it's what you represent. It is the history that they know of the Bureau's involvement in Native America that they are reacting to, not the individual. What we have to do, and I think this answers the question that's posed here, is take the initial steps of looking at things in almost a dispassionate moment of just stepping back and saying, okay, what happened? Why did it happen? What were the circumstances that surrounded it? What do we need to do to open that dialogue? And it's hard. It's hard. Opening the dialogue is very hard. And Angeline is asking a question. She says, what first practical steps do you advocate beyond awareness? I advocate listening. The hardest thing to do is to listen, you know, because we don't listen to listen. We listen to respond. It's always fun talking to people and you finish what you're saying and they're already talking before you finished your last, last word. And they're responding to the very beginning what you said, not the, con the whole thing of what you said. We have to listen and be willing not to say anything. You know, some of this is going to be hard. It's just going to be up in the way we tend to think, and it's going to cause us to be angry. It's going to cause us to be accusatory. But part of that process is sitting back and just listening. I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of elders. And one of the things I've learned about my, my elders is don't ever ask them something you don't want to know because they're going to tell you everything. And I, I tease my students because I can be very long winded. I admit that. But they'll ask a question and I will answer it as fully as I can. And they're sitting there and you, their eyes glaze over. And I'm like, oh, come on, guys, wake up. And I'm like, you know, when you sit down with your grandparents, and you, you ask them how their day was. And they give you the blow by blow. I got up, I had my coffee, I got the paper, I walked the dog. And you're sitting there going, I just want them to, and you're and looking at my suit saying, you just want them to say, it was a good day, it was a bad day, right? And they're like, yeah. And I said, but why are they telling you that? And they're like, I don't know. I said, well, did you listen to what they said? What they're telling you is, what their life is like, how they are actually engaging in day-to-day -day activities. And they may express something that tells you they're having a problem, that they're not going to tell you straight out or that something really good's happening. You've got to listen to all that. But that's not how we've been, that's not how we've been trained to listen. We've been trained to respond. And that's hard to break out of. I'm terrible at it. I admit it. I'm the guy who advocates to listen, to listen, yet sometimes I just don't do it. That's something 
we all got to check ourselves on. And the other practical step is remember, this isn't going to happen tomorrow. We're not going to all wake up tomorrow and say, great, we're ready to roll. This is a day by day process. This is a minute by minute work through. You know, as you start working through this stuff, you find that you have to set it aside for a minute and then you come back to it. Involved in all of this is a much larger process that's begun to happen. Last year, Gavin Newsom, the governor, issued an apology to the indigenous people of California for what happened. And in that executive order, he says that there should be a truth and healing commission established. The commission was announced and COVID-19 happened. And it's sort of been dormant for a while until just a few months ago, the commission has, the, the work has begun. The state of California is embarking on what is probably the most ambitious movement in transitional justice that any state in this union has taken. Uh, Maine did something with their child welfare system in the Wabanaki. It's sort of modeled after this, but this is a much larger, much larger and more comprehensive event that's going to be happening over the course till 2025, from 2020 to 2025. There are going to be meetings and conversations, people expressing what they understand happened here, how they're still experiencing it. The fact that, you know, even into the late 1970s, a Native woman could go into an Indian Health Service hospital, a public hospital, their doctor, and be sterilized because the state didn't feel that they should have children, too many children. And we've seen the reports that came out about three years ago where it's been documented that that's what the state of California did to Latinas in this state. They were sterilized without their knowledge. They would go in for one procedure, have the procedure and while they were doing this, they were sterilized. The ramifications of what happened are present today. Native American people have the highest rates of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, of any population in the country. We also have the highest rates of suicide. One of those reasons is dysfunctionality, the breaking of that past, that disruption that happened, that has eliminated the cultural boundaries and barriers, the questioning of where do I fit in how do I as a native person fit into this larger thing when I can't, I can't even learn about myself? The educating about indigenous people is relatively new in our school systems. The, the discipline of itself, Native American studies has only really come of age in the last 10, 15 years. We have a large group of new Native scholars who are coming out. There is a component to that in that if you don't see yourself represented anywhere, how do you fashion that idea, that dream to move on, to go to be something? And we, we all, you know, everyone struggles with that at some point, what that identity component is. And I find it interesting that here in 2020, when I stand in front of a classroom, for about 85% of my students, I am the very first native person that they have ever had teach a class. I'm the first native instructor they ever had. And I'm sitting there going, this doesn't make sense to me. Not that I think we should all be in the classroom, but that where do the perspectives come from? Where did those components arise from? Why is it that we aren't there? Go ahead, Dave. We have a question here from Stephanie. 
Mm -hmm. which was asking if you are going to be taking part in the Truth and Reconciliation Conference, and uh, if not, do you hope to be, and how one would actually be participating in that conference? Is it by recommendation, nomination? Yeah, so the commission is established by the state, and there it will be made up of representatives from northern, central, there's four, re four areas. They'll be made up of representatives of federally recognized and non-federally recognized tribes, elected officials. Those will be the voting members. There will be a series of what are called non-voting members who that we don't know how they have no idea how those are going to be appointed yet. Those are that's still in the works. I will not be part of the commission, um, not because I don't want to be. It's because I'm going to be studying the commission. The next phase of my work is to actually study the commission. And it's very hard to study something that you're a part of. So I'm going to be, I, I'm generally the guy that's on the camera at the other end, listening in. I know, I've, I talk with all the staff members. <laughs> I know them all very, very well by this point. I, I don't want to be part of it because I can't be objective and I have to step back and, you know, I, I, I agree with some things that they're talking about and I disagree. But part of my job is I'm also a historian, which means my opinion doesn't matter. My job is to record what happens and say, you, as the public, need to make up your own mind. That, that's what I see my position as. So yeah, I, I am studying them in the sense that I sit through and I take notes and shake my head and keep my mouth shut. So there'll be a book in about 10 years. Read that. <laughs> That'll be good. But think about that for a second. You know, if we're going to do this, if we're really going to do this, let's let's do it. Let's have that conversation about what that entails and how we move move through all that. And what is it and how do we perceive people? How do we see people not as people, but as their position? And that's where I want to take you next is I do an exercise with my students that I don't think they ever really appreciate till they're gone. Let's see. The course now I would have technical difficulties. There we go. There it is. Do you see a blue dot on your screen? Okay. A blue dot. What does that mean? Yes, I see a blue dot. Thank you. So I put this on. I walk in one day during the semester, usually the day I haven't prepared anything. And I draw the circle and I fill it in on the board and I have my students take out paper and I say, tell me what this is. And then I just shut up and I sit there and I give them about 15 to 20 minutes just to work on this blue dot. So think for, take 26 seconds. And just think about it. You don't have to write anything. Just think about what this blue dot could represent. And I asked them to share with me what that blue dot is, and they come up with some great things. It's a portal to another world. It's a flag of a new nation. It's a dot on a dress. And we go through all that. And at the end, they, I say, okay. And they all look, and I, I'm ready to wrap class up. And they go, well, what is it? I said, it's a blue dot. And they look at me, I said, part the, and what I'm trying to get across to them, which, which they do re realize is we create stories by what we see. We create a lot of stories. We create a lot of perception just based on a visual representation based on what we think we may know. And we have to step back from that and ask ourselves sometimes, is it more than just a dot? You know, I don't know, because, you know, I get the, you, they always try to corner me into giving my opinions that I don't necessarily have an opinion, um, which is very hard for a lot of people to believe because I'm generally a very opinionated person. It's like, there are a lot of things I just don't because I don't know enough about it yet to form one. And that's how we get, that's how we do this. That's how we move things. So in your next commute to work, 
your next walk outside, your next whatever, look around at, at what you see and ask yourself, what story does it tell? What story could be happening there? What is all involved in that? And, you know, it can move us a little closer to having that conversation. You know, I walk through museums and I find them fascinating. They're some of my favorite places to go. Just because I always look at things, I'm like, I always read the little interpretation cards and I'm like, okay, what's the rest of it? What, what more is there to it? Because that's, that's how we get to this point. That's how we get to do this. You know, I've, I delved into studying genocide, not for any other reason than I can't understand why we do it. I can't understand why this is part of the human condition. What causes us to do this? And I've come to a couple possible answers. The first is fear. We fear what we don't know. We fear ramifications. We fear those things that we don't have answers to. And the other thing is we haven't taken the time to step back and say, what's really happening here? What, what is the underlying component of this? And that's how I sort of approach this and approach interacting with the world is how do we get there? And it's really comes from having grown up around some elders and it grows from growing up in a native communities, growing up around a good, strong Irish Catholic family that's done that. I hope I have not left you with tons of questions, but I'm really excited to hear what you have to say and give you a chance to talk because I've been taking up a lot of space. Thank you. We can open up, Dave. We're good. Excellent, Carrie. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Really appreciate you speaking here. So, as Carrie just mentioned, we are going to turn this over now to the rest of the room. If you have any questions, do please feel free to ask them. Hey, Carrie, it's Chris. Hey, Chris. So, you just mentioned fear recently, and as you know, fear is a large part of my dissertation. What were some of the early, early fears? Uh, during first contact that might have led or did lead us down the path that we experienced. Does that kind of make sense? Uh, you know, no, no, that makes sense. Um, one of the fears right off the bat was, and I'm going to say this and I do not have an issue with Christianity. I do have to just say it like it is. Christianity is perfectly fine. There was a fear that these were heathens and that they would they they would contaminate the Christians that were were coming here. That that was a big fear that they would pull them away from God. There was a big fear that the fluidity of identity, male female hierarchies, would upend the way the early explorers, when the Spanish when they got here, and later the Americans, that that would upend all that. That that would cause chaos. And that was one of the big fears. The other fear was the unknown. There were, the, there were these people here speaking a different language. They were also here doing things they had never seen before. And we fear that. So, but the primary one of the, the really big one, if you read the old journals is they were going to pull people away from Christianity and that's just what happened. Thanks. I, I kind of like that. Uh, I'm learning a lot more about uh, that same fear of contamination as you mm -hmm. sort of discussed. And, and I was just wondering if what I'm thinking in other areas of the world in space and time uh, is synchronous with what you're looking at and it appears like it is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Uh, we have a comment here from AJ. Uh, I have AJ a made uh, sorry. comment. Just one second there, Marty. We had a comment from AJ that uh, I agree that fear of the unknown is a major cause of why man. I feel there's a difference between religion and Christianity. Possibly, I am not a religious scholar, um, so I can't. That's I'm going to pass on. Not I'm going to punt that question, but I think that's something to delve into and discuss what that really means. And oh, 
Uh, Marty, will you who are the next one? Yes, I have a question. I'm sorry, I don't know why it's that going. Um, uh, when I was in high school, uh, I was quoted the, the book, uh, A Century of Dishonor. Mm -hmm. Have you, uh, do you use that in uh, research? Helen Hunt Jackson's book, yes. It is probably one of the, um, so Helen Hunt Jackson wrote A Century of Dishonor. And she had a hard time getting it published. And so she wanted the United States to understand what it had done. So she actually paid for the printing of and distribution of one copy to every member of Congress at the time. It's a great book. It is valid. I still use it. Um, somewhere behind this fake screen that used <laughs> this landscape, there is a copy of it back here. Actually, there's four copies come to think of it, <laughs> different editions. It's a great book and you should, if you can get access to it, there's a newer version out, I believe. Take some time and really read through it. That'll be good. Well, I, I got a copy of it at the San Diego State and yeah. uh, it looked like it had never been looked at. Unfortunately, that tends to be the case. Um, yeah, the two copies, I picked up two copies that were probably 10 or 15 years old and it didn't look like they'd ever been opened until I got a hold of them. That'll be good. <laughs> Uh, the next question we have here comes from Elizabeth McClure. Um, Harry, I'll read that out for you. This is a two-parter, uh, and it's a matter on, and it goes back to the same topic of access here. Reaching back to the ratification of the California treaties, can we access and view them as the public? And could we defer them to Article 2 of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide in regards to boarding schools and the sterilization of women? Okay. So let's deal with the treaty question first. The treaties have all now been digitized. They are accessible through, um, I believe it's the Library of Congress at this point. So you can find those online. So yes, they are accessible. Um, I don't know that there's any work going on around them in the sense to try to get them ratified. Um, there's a provision in an 1871 <sighs> spending bill that prevents further Indian treaties being dealt with. So in regards to Article 2 of the Convention on the Prevention and the Punishment of the Crime of Genocide from 1948, here's an interesting thing, is we're talking about issues of the past. And if we're going to, we, and to take these to court, we have a longstanding provision on punishment retroactively. If it was legal at the time, we generally don't punish. Now, that said, the Nuremberg trials prosecuted crime, prosecuted things that were totally legal in Germany at the time. Not to say that they were right. I'm just, from a legal standpoint, under the Third Reich laws, they were legal. Totally abhorrent, totally wrong. And there's actually a huge debate over whether that, sh you know, those trials were legitimate at this point. Um, and I'll leave that alone. So. Taking those issues now to the Hague would be very difficult. I think your best bet, our best bet is like the new Genoa school, new Genoa Indian school that has had all their archives digitized. They're now, they just went on the web this week, I believe, this week or last week, I can't remember. And part of it is to begin collecting those stories, collecting that history and sharing it so people can have that discussion and begin to, you know, interact with this. So I hope that answers that. I had a question come to me privately that says, can you talk a bit about how the people have kept their culture alive, specifically about the role and place of landscape? Primarily that they've lived. Native people are still here, though we tend to always be talked about as if we're in the past. I don't know, it's like they always were or are, and they always were, they weren't are. Um, a lot of it has gone around dealing with the fact that languages are being used. You see a lot of programs within tribal communities through both tribes and native organizations to go out and do work in gathering and in basket making, regalia making, language. So all of that is, all of that is coming, I don't want to say coming back. It, it's rising to the surface again. It's coming out and being there. 
and you're seeing you're seeing it in a lot of things, especially uh, naming conventions. Now we have a lot of children being given native names again, which is great. And so all of that is coming back. Um, the other thing is you're seeing tribes do something. And I think it's probably been more relevant this year than last, but most of the last couple of years is California's ex had extreme wildfires. I mean, we've all been affected by it, whether you were in the fires or south, you've all, we've all been dealing with this. And the biggest way that's happened is it is native people who the California fire, California fire, fire islands, they are going to and asking you, how do we deal with this? How do we do the prescribed burns? How do we do all of these things? And we're seeing that come back and, and happening. And we see the same thing happening in Australia. The Australian government is finally going to the Aboriginal people saying, okay, how do we not have this happen again? So that's all begun to coming back. And that'll be very good. There's a question from Don and Mary. Uh, yes, uh, congratulations. You just gave a wonderful talk. Oh, thank uh, you. My particular uh, uh, area that I've worked in quite a bit is uh, the Spanish settlement, which was by King Carlos the mm Third, -hmm. and um, he the, the original Spanish settlement was to build pueblos and presidios, and the uh, priests were brought along with a 10 year life, they were supposed to put the missions in for 10 years. And at the end of 10 years, uh, they were to become parish churches. Uh, Father Sarah objected to that uh, strenuously. And uh, in, our, and in Los Angeles, uh, Father Sarah was really violently against the Pueblo in Los Angeles because the Pueblo in Los Angeles had the Indians work there under terrible conditions, by the way, but that, that's another story. But they did not have to convert from their native religion to Catholicism in order to work in the Pueblo. And Father Sarah thought, quite correctly, that this was quite a, an impact on the missionary system over in San Gabriel and later San Fernando. Uh, so anyway, there, there is a more of a, oh, and then later on, the people that wrote the history of California were basically the missionaries because they had the money. Uh -huh. <laughs> you can read the missionaries' history of the civil of California, not the real history that was by the Spanish government. There's a lot of reconciling that needs to go between what the missionaries wrote and what came from the Spanish government. And uh -huh. that, that work is happening. It is happening. Yeah, sure. But yeah it's beginning to happen and yeah it there is a you know you could do an entire series on spanish settlement in california over a course of maybe two years and still only really scratch the surface of it but yeah. yes okay can i chime in yes sure. angeline of course. hi um so thank you very much that was a wonderful talk um thank about, you. and i love everything you had to say and one of the um, topics that I think is really salient is this idea that people, Native people are thought of as in the past. And I think, and part of that is that the distrust that's been engendered from the westward expansion, Manifest Destiny, the whole thing, the United States government and all the genocide you were talking about and everybody clamming up, you know, and um, not sharing about their culture. And coincidentally, I was actually, I actually met a Mexica educator at the Imperial Valley Desert Museum at one of the cultural events that you had there. Um, and he was, he was advocating that it's been 500 plus some years since colonization and pe the elders need to begin releasing some information about their culture because you can't protect what you don't love and you can't love something if you don't understand it. And so I'm a rock art specialist and that involves a lot of understanding about um, creation stories and uh, ritual customs and that kind of thing. And I would love, personally, I would love to talk to you or any other um, you know, scholars who might be who are affiliated with 
tribes in how that we can bring those some I understand some things are related to initiation rights and those kind of things and protected by gender but if there are some ways that we can bring more education about what it's like to be in the culture uh, I think that would help a lot um, in terms of creating some kind of familiarity with this different culture. Otherwise it just seems exotic and not real. And that's why the Southwest can sell all kinds of quote Coco Pelli art, you know, paraphernalia. So, cause it just seems like a, a, a toy, you know, it's not real. Um, so I, I wanna put that forward and see if you have any comments about that. Also, I grew up in Humboldt. I went to Arcata High School. All right. I don't know if you know, <laughs> I don't know if you if you know Rob England, but he's also Europe, yes. Europe and he worked in uh, suicide prevention. He's a buddy yeah. of mine. Yeah. <laughs> I went. I actually went through school at Humboldt with Rob. So yes, I do know him. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's a good yeah. guy. <laughs> no, it is, a, it is, it's interesting. Um, it is a, there is a fetishment of it. Um, and it hasn't stopped. Um, I have a little nephew. Uh, well, he's not little anymore, but he was little at the time. So he's probably six. And they lived down in um, San Bernardino. So we'd gone down to visit my in-laws. And my little nephew was there. And he comes up and he's like, Tio Carey, Tio Carey. And I'm like, what's up? And he's like, are you a real Indian? I'm like, yes, I am. And he looks at me and he goes, do you have a weapon? And I said, no. He's like, then you're not real. And off he ran. How we're represented, I mean, really, just look at the films lately. Uh, if you look at just movies, um, let's not even talk about what Johnny Depp did in The Lone Ranger. We'll just leave that alone. You look at what was done in the Twilight series. I know you don't have to have watched it. Don't watch it. It's a bad series. You look at all of that and it always shows Native people as something other than. Other than. And it's so, yeah, we we do become fetishized in a lot of ways. And you get that a lot. And I was with a bunch of other scholars um, probably five years ago now. And we had spent us, you know, we went to one of those summer things where we're all sitting in a classroom for a week learning. And at the end, we all went out, we walked from the campus we were at, went downtown to the local bar to get something to drink and eat and, you know, say goodbye to one another. And over the course of the week, um, there was this anthropologist from Brandeis University. And she was there and uh, She'd every time I'd go somewhere, she was right there. And I'm like, okay. And she just tagged along with the group. And I was like, this is fine. So we're at the pub that night. And I, I'm a San Jose Sharks fan. I like hockey. And the Sharks were playing the Penguins that night. They were, they were on their way to the Stanley Cup. They were going to lose. I knew it, but I was still going to watch because that's what the Sharks do. They break our hearts. And I'm watching them lose. And she's sitting next to me. And she goes, do people find you fascinating? Uh, my mind is on hockey at this moment, folks. And I look at her and I'm like, I I've never thought about it. I go, I just sort of do what I do. And she goes, but it must be so fascinating. And she begins to pet me on the shoulder. And I'm like looking at her going, this is weird, number one. Number two, I'm trying to register what is re what what's driving this. And she starts talking about this character called Vinatu. Vinatu is a fictional creation by an author named Karl May, and it's he was huge in Germany. He was the basically the J.K. Rowling or Stephen King of his time. He sold so many books. She had grown up around the Vinatu movies and books and character that her perception of a native person wasn't a real person, but rather was an object or a character. That, that's really what we have to battle with. There are a lot of, there's a lot of work going on. Um, I know here and I know throughout central and southern California, 
there are a lot of organizations who are working with elders to pass this knowledge on, to bring it out, to document it. One of the things that um, has happened is a lot of tribes have now what are called tribal historic preservation offices. They are the equivalent of a state historic preservation office. What a lot of these TIPOs have done is they've begun to record, do video and audio recordings of elders, do interviews with them and capture all of this digitally. Many, I, mean, I shouldn't say it like that, I should say most of the time when they do this, many of these elders sign, sign a release, but they put an embargo on it saying, you can use this when I'm gone because I'm telling you things right now that are going to set people who are alive and I don't want to be here when they find this out. <laughs> so I think what's going to happen, and it's sad that it has to happen this way, is as that generation leaves us, we're going to begin getting a lot of that. And then, you know, you have the internal family things where things are being passed on and they're sharing them out. So I think it's there. I, I think we have to also get, we, we are almost to the last generation who went to forest boarding school. And I think once we see that generation move on, things are going to get a little easier because it's still, it's still ingrained with them and with them is that you don't do certain things. You don't do this and it's, it's hard to get past that. So it's sad to say that, but I think that's, what's going to happen, but that, that's just my opinion. And there's probably somebody else out there is in a completely contrary opinion. That'd be good. We may also be passing the last generation that is part of the old guard of anthropology. Yeah. Yes, we're very close to that happening. Yeah. I'm just reading the comment here to see if there's a question. <laughs> those who cannot read the comments, I was just going to read these aloud here as well, uh, in case everybody is not chiming in from a computer. Uh, we just had one from Stephanie, which was um, identifying that's so true, unfortunately, for every culture. I think that we fall, uh, fall battle being unreal. We also have to battle feeding into this because we are uh, only one individual within a culture with a large history and memory. It's a fantastic point. And from AJ, we just received one saying she loves California history, and it stands her to see what is done, what has been done to Native American Indians. I hope this commission will be able to address uh, some of the bigger issues of the past with, uh, without creating a bigger problem moving forward. And, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was actually going to use this as a uh, launch up one to ask you a question myself there, Gary. Go for it. Go for it. One of the uh, biggest challenges, I think, that is lingering in the background to this, but is not often as discussed, is it's very much easy to point and to point this as a conflict between us versus them, between colonization and the effects of colonization on tribal identity and uh, self-identity. And the other thing though that is overlooked is how tribes typically pre-colonial, uh, uh, pre-exploration existed with one another, also oftentimes both with or against, and it was a complex relationship. And today we very much tend to ignore that tapestry, that history and just branch everybody together, I think, into the, well, this is uh, modern California. This is uh, the effects of colonization against Indians as a large group. And that is certainly not the case. Um, it, in several ways, I think the system enforces it and even uh, sometimes even plays against the idea of one tribe against another for anything varying from, uh, identification, uh, recognition as a federal tribe, uh, allocation of resources, land rights, anything and everything in between. Do you see these as ongoing matters? And more importantly, how do, what resolution could possibly be done there with things like this commission? So that's sort of the romanticizing of native people. We were free, we're all running around naked, hugging trees and all got along. That, that, that didn't happen. <laughs> That did not happen. Um, you know, there, there was conflict. There was conflict. Different ways of resolution, though. I know that my tribes, the Yurks and the Krooks and the Hoopas and all of us, if we had a war or a conflict, even when the conflict ended, you had to sit down and negotiate how, not just how to end it, but who, how to repay all the damage you did, which is a very different concept than what 
in the Western society. And you'll find that throughout California. So, but there was conflict, there was disagreement. And you see that today, we have several tribes in California who are unrecognized, who are trying to go through the federal recognition process. However, in many cases, there are federally recognized tribes who are blocking that process. And it comes down to a couple of things. One is allocation of resources. The federal budget for native people is less than 1% of 1%. It's the fact that, you know, Let's be honest about this. Many tribes have made a lot of money in the gaming industry. And there's always a fear you put one more tribe with land, they'll build another casino and they'll take away your patrons. Uh, I used to work for federally recognized tribes. I worked for about 15 years for them. I worked for a casino tribe who, when another tribe went to open a casino, all they wanted to do was stop it because they were afraid that it would take their revenues. It's the being more concerned about what somebody else has versus being concerned with what you have. If they have it, why don't I? Um, and, and that's part of that imposition of Western ideology of being about the I versus the we. I think it comes from what happens when we begin to see a generation of leaders who come through who have really delved into this. I mean, I've talked to, you know, I've had an opportunity to talk to a lot of native leaders, a lot of tribal councils, just a course of my life. And one of the biggest and most interesting things is they were primarily educated in business or, poli or political science. So there's not a lot of people who have a real background at the tribal level within native studies who have studied their own history to this extent that an individual would in this. So I think what you think as we have seen the number of native students who are now in these programs who are combining with anthropology, combining with business and economics, I think we'll see a lot of that change. Now the commission can help resolve some of this by sitting down and saying, what is it that the state can do? The state can actually create a series of state recognized tribes, which would provide some recognition. The state could actually open its archives, its massive archives on Indian papers that it has. Um, it has some private collections within the state library. Um, the Huntington has some papers. All There's papers that are held that have the documentations these, these non-federally recognized tribes need to make their case. So we need those archives opened and we need people to go in and dig into that. So I hope that answers your question. Absolutely, and we have a few new ones that have come up okay. uh, both as a result and in the meanwhile. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Uh, this one comes from Roman Flores. Uh, how does one that knows they have a Native American lineage dig into and what uh, find what tribes they, uh, tribe or tribes they came from? You start by doing your family tree. That's the first thing. Um, you have to build your family tree from you to your parents and back. Get that, that's going to be your first and primary thing. And then you're going to have to access some records. Um, a DNA test will not work. I know Ancestry.com and loves to put those ads out, but that doesn't provide the federal component of it, the political status component. So one of the things that needs to happen is you've got to go back and look and see nine to one there's probably a family member who was at boarding school. Where would they have gone? Look at the region that they lived, where their family was from, to figure out what school they may have gone to. You can access the National Archive records. Um, they, there's some online you can do some searching or they're currently closed, but you can send queries in. The other thing to do is look at your local, um, look at local historical societies. They will often have the old um, court records in which quote unquote indigent Indians would be put into unpaid labor or we would call it slavery, but that's not what it was called then. With a family or someone, they would have those records. So you, ha you have to really do a, a deep dive into your own lineage and build onto all of that. So th that's how you would go about it. It's a step-by-step -step process. If you go to the Bureau of Indian Affairs website, they do have a guide on how to do that. Um, so you can look there as well. Thank you. 
the next question here comes from Angeline. She had one, uh, let her elaborate. She wanted to ask about the Yurok. Yep. I have, I'm so fascinated by the Yurok because um, they make pit houses, which is odd for Northern California. Um, it's very much like the Southwest. And I've actually heard uh, stories from, you know, written down from uh, generations ago about the Yurok being people who went up the coast from the South. I don't know if that's verifiable, but uh, could you answer some of those questions or tell me anything you know about that? Uh, we do have um, basically their their shelter. They have a their redwood plank houses. They have a pit in the middle. Um, we are we're part of the we're the southernmost part of the Pacific Northwest of the cultural groups. So California is a little different in that you have the Great Basin and the Southwest and Pacific Northwest all come together in one state, which is different than most states. I have not heard that we pro we made our way from the Southwest. I've not heard that. Um, I've heard of other groups on their way to the Southwest leaving people here and going, but I haven't heard that. There is, to my knowledge, I, the only book that I can think of would be a book by um, Lucy Thompson to the American Indian that might have something about that, uh, connected to that. Other than that, the best people to talk to would be at the tribe themselves. Uh, the cultural department would know that, but no, I've, yeah. But yeah, our houses, in fact, we still have them and they're still used for dances and everything. Do, do any other tribes locally make those pit houses or are you guys the only ones? Uh, we ought to Yurok, Hoopa, Karuk, use them. I believe Talawa does also. So most most of us, because we're all part of that Pacific Northwest group, family group. Excellent. And the last question we have in the queue here comes from Donna Mary. Uh, do you have any uh, solid references you could share on the history of the boarding school system? Uh, boarding School Blues is a great book. I am The author is escaping me right now. And then I believe it's called, I believe the book is called The School on Magnolia Street, which is about Sherman Indian High School. Those would be two really good ones to look at right off the bat. Boarding School Blues was written by Clifford Trasser. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the benefits of having the other uh, individual there for you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Do we have any other questions for the night? All right, then I think we are going to say big thank you, of course, to our speaker tonight, Carrie Malloy. Carrie, thank you so much for sharing your experience, your wisdom, your uh, knowledge on the subject, and hopefully adding a little bit more of a uh, depth to our own as well there. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Everyone, Carrie. Thank you so much for joining us here at the Imperial Valley Desert Museum's Evening Experts. Uh, next month, we have our spring, uh, fall concert series with Beth Chippy Hun on December 5th at 6 p.m. That is also the conclusion of our fall fundraiser. If you are interested in participating, we do have several opportunities still for you to participate. Uh, tickets can be purchased through PayPal, calling the museum, or by our uh, email. Uh, the information is at the very top of the link, and I'll be sharing that with you uh, once again in the chat here as well. And of course, do not forget to bid on our opportunity for the four-night weekend get on four-night vacation beachside getaway to Monterey, and that would be available for you uh, the link again in the chat here in a moment. Thank you, everyone, again, and one more time, Carrie. Thank you so much for joining us here. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Everyone have a great evening and hopefully we'll see you again next month with our next event. And let me put, post those links for you here now. You did mention the pictures from the front porch. Yes, yes uh, uh, the four nights four nights, uh, uh, getaway that uh, in Monterey that we're offering for the silent auction, which you can bid on. Marty Fritzerka, if you can see his screen right there, that will actually, that is the site, that is the view you would get from the front porch of that house. So I just provide the link there for PayPal. 
And we are going to include the links as well for the summit auction. And then for the fall concert. if technology works. And there we are. All right. Well, um, again, if anybody has any final questions, but Kerry, I think you are all set. Thank all you right. So much. Thank you very if much. You, this link will, and this talk has been recorded and will be made available for all of you. So Kerry, you can share with your students and you, if anyone in the audience missed part of it or like to share with their friends, it will be made available uh, in about two weeks time. We'll be make, making an announcement through our social media. And you can always catch it then at that point. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye.